Neil, do you you're an agnostic, right? That's that word comes closest to describing my circumstances. Yes. Uh, have you really looked into Jesus Christ and if he um, if he is the true God? Yes, I have. Yes, yeah, so I, I, I look more broadly, and I take a step back, and I look at the world's religions, and I look at the world's gods that have been praised throughout the history of our species, and that number is huge. It's almost an unlimited scroll. Where I find myself returning is uh, to 1755 in uh, Portugal, Lisbon. Tens of thousands of people were killed in the church during this, uh, this case. Then... Because the epicenter was offshore, it wasn't just the earthquake. There was a tsunami that followed that basically wiped Lisbon from the map. Something like 80,000 people died. There is a god. That god is either not all-powerful or not all-good. Because many innocent people died. Or maybe 80,000 people were all criminals. But were the children criminals? Were the... You know, the women and children who are just trying to, you know, keep the household. So there's no good answer to that other than the, the, the repeated one, which is God works in mysterious ways. Well, that means yeah. you don't really understand God. And if you don't understand God, why do you believe you understand him if something nice happens? Oh, that's God working miracles. No, you, if you don't understand God, are you going to cherry pick how and when and where you claim to understand the motives? So I step back and I see this. And all I can say is, I remain unconvinced that there is any kind of divine power at work anywhere in the universe, based on what I see. Why does religion have such a persistent hold on human thought despite all that we know of science? Uh, <clears throat> yeah, I think there are several ways one can address that question. I, consider not long ago when so much of the Western world was the state was the religion. And we have actually moved quite a distance from that compared with 200 years ago, 300 years ago, 400 years ago, the era of the Inquisition and this sort of thing. And so, so to say that it has such a grip, it has a fraction of the grip that it once did on the operations of human conduct and of society. So the real question is, if implicit in that is, given what we know of science, why would religion still have any grip at all? Not to, why does it still have a big grip? Because it's not a big grip when you look um, in, the, in the, the developed world. So, in fact, most of Europe are just, they're, you know, they're whole countries where religion has essentially disappeared entirely. And the countries are not, the, the countries are not full of violence and, you know, it's just, the assumption that you have to be religious to be moral is a false one. It's empirically false, because you just look around in places where that's the case. So, um, so, so, so that's one fact. And pull away from that a little. There's plenty of what goes on in religious texts that has tremendous value to how to think about life and how to treat one another. Uh, in fact, uh, Jefferson created what was essentially what you can think of as the Jeff Thomas Jefferson, the Jefferson Bible. I don't know if you ever heard of this. He went through the Bible, and I think both the Old and the New Testaments, and he crossed off everything that was sort of mythical, magical, uh, things that clearly violated known laws of nature, and kept the rest and said, here is the, the stuff of the Bible that Will, should have value to any modern person going forward. If you look at people who are religious today, who are not in conflict with science, they have viewed their religious text as a spiritual, something that gives them spiritual support, not as a science textbook. The, the, inter, the, the conflict in society is when you have those who are still religious, who want to use their religious text as their access point to understanding the natural world and persistent efforts of the past to make that happen have just simply failed. The, the, the Bible does not work as a science textbook. In fact, Galileo knew this and he himself was a religious man. He's famously quoted as saying, the Bible 
tells you how to go to heaven, not how the heavens go. <laughs> so on that scale, the, the, the conflict comes about when that subset of the religious community feels threatened by scientific discoveries that are different from how they interpret what should, the natural world should be in the Bible. I think, and, I think it's that point where you get to the concept of the God of the gaps. The, the, you go, we do not understand this, you know, science takes us so far, but we don't understand anything beyond that. Therefore, that's God. Hmm. The stuff that we don't get, that's God. And the trouble with that is the moment that you actually go, no, we do understand that now. Is people are going, well, did God just go away then? And, and, and it goes back, you know, nice simple things like the rainbow. The point where you go, well, the rainbow actually, it's, it's an optical effect. It's not something magic that gets put up in the sky to memorialize the flood. Plus, did you know that everyone sees a unique rainbow? No. That's right. Um, the rainbow is an optical effect for the person who sees it. So if you stand 10 feet to my left, you see an actual, a different rainbow than I see. It's a remarkable, uh, fun fact about rainbows. My, my, yeah. my, fa my favorite fun fact about rainbows is the fact that they were originally believed to have six color bands, but that Newton added, added indigo and violet. Yeah, Newton just liked, to, he liked, he liked seven. the number seven. He had yeah. the mystical feeling for the number seven. Throws in indigo that no one else sees. Yeah. Nobody, I mean, yeah. hands up here, who actually goes, Indigo, violet. There's the indigo. You yeah, don't. Yeah. You just go purple. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> go exactly. blue, purple. But oh, so another thing about the rainbow, because each rainbow is unique to the viewer, it can only be a rainbow that is exactly face on to you. You've never seen a rainbow that was like at an oblique angle. Think about it. They're exactly hemispherical in front of you. That's why you can never get to the base of the rainbow. Because that would mean your perspective on it would change. That's what makes it a good place to hide the gold. Okay? <laughs> In case you didn't know. All right. Now, when you talk about these things, somebody in the audience must come up, I assume, and say, well, oh, we only understand 4% of this stuff. Yeah, and that's great. So how I love that, it. <laughs> how, how is that different from Bill O'Reilly saying, well, in that case, the rest of it's God. And we, you, you guys are just, you're just expounding beliefs here. You've got no evidence <laughs> the for the 96%. <laughs> the difference is we do understand the tides. <laughs> the tides are part of the 4% we understand. So Bill O'Reilly is giving a list of things that are fully understood. If he had given a list of things that are not understood, okay, that would be a different reaction, and it would be less susceptible to comedic mockery than saying, tides come in and out, you can't explain that. It's like, yes, we can. We've known that one for the last couple of hundred years. Give me a better example. So if he said, there's dark matter and there's, there's dark energy forcing an expansion of the universe so fast that it's accelerating, you can't explain that. Right. We can't explain it. <laughs> I don't think he knows enough physics to be able to tell us what it is we don't understand yet. That would have been a more interesting exchange with the atheist guy. I, I, I forgot his name, forgive me, but the guy who, who, who he was interviewing. Now, if he wants to use that as evidence for God, but then we just have to come back and say, well, does it mean if you don't understand it, something and the community of physicists don't understand it, understand it that means God did it? Is that is that how you want to play this game? Because if it is, here's a list of the things in the past that the physicist at the time didn't understand. And a talk show you might have conducted 200 years ago would have said, the planets do retrograde? Can't understand that, must be a god. And we'd say, you know, you're right. And then 10 years later, we understand it, so what do you do? So you're, if, that's how, if that's how you want to invoke your evidence for God, then God is an ever-receding pocket of scientific ignorance that's getting smaller and smaller and smaller as time moves on. So just be ready for that to happen if that's how you want to come at the problem. So that's just simply the God of the gaps argument. It's been around forever. So in fact people who want to make arguments... And by the way, hey, wait, wait, and I don't, I don't even mind, I don't even care if someone wants to say you don't understand that 
God did it. I, that doesn't even bother me. What would bother me is if you were so content in that answer that you no longer had curiosity to learn how it happened. If the day you stop looking because you're content God did it, I don't need you in the lab. You're useless on the frontier of understanding the nature of the world. Speaking of Earth, what, how do you feel about the people that think it's only 6,000 years old? Uh, it's, they, they, if they think that, they think that because that is mandated by their religious philosophy. Exactly. Uh, okay. Uh, <laughs> you know, I mean, uh, just keep it out of the science classroom. That, that's all. I, I don't try to confuse that with doing science. Mm. Science, we have learned. Science has completely transformed our culture. It's doubled our life expectancy. It has brought comfort and uh, health and well-being. And, and not only science, but the fruits of science, the technological fruits oh, yeah. of science. And, of course, you need to be good shepherds of this power because in the wrong hands, it could be used for evil. All right. This is the great sort of evil. dichotomy of great the great uh, of unlocking the secrets of nature. Mm -hmm. So uh, so I don't I'm not going to fight them to tell them the universe is not just 6, stay out of years. your way. No, 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 not my just the science classroom. Right. No, no. And and and. If you want to put it in the science classroom, understand the ramifications. Right. Mm. Your country will go bankrupt because you will no longer be in a position to forge the economies of tomorrow that will require uh, science and technological innovation. And at least the next question, because a few people on the lines are asking, do you believe in God? I, I've, I'm not convinced. If, if here, Here's the thing. If every, every time I talk about God with someone who's a believer, God is... is is all powerful and all knowing and 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 all good, right? The, the good is a big part of this. Mm -hmm. And then I look at all the ways Earth wants to kill us. <laughs> Strike uh, you know, a tsunami takes out a quarter million people. Hurricanes, earthquakes, tornadoes, floods, and and I add all of that up. Either the God is not all powerful. Or is not all good, but <laughs> yeah. it can't really be both, given all the ways the universe wants to kill us. And and and, and if, if Earth is not uh, finished killing you, there's the asteroid that could come in. Right. An mm -hmm. asteroid rendered seventy percent of all life forms extinct back in uh, the, the famous one in sixty-five million years ago that took out the dinosaurs. So there's so many ways to die not at the hands of someone else who has free will mm -hmm. that i i don't know what what is the nature of the god that you're talking about i i, I gotta like try to like use your logic back at you uh -huh. but don't we define what what is good and what is bad so we see a tsunami wipe out a whole bunch of people and we're, we're as human beings going wow that's bad because we define what bad is maybe in god's brain eyes whatever the hell that that's not bad well but except you defined what god is Oh boy! Wow! Now that's, you did it. That's so. Ridiculous. Why? Why do you have the power to define who and what God is, right? But not have the power to define what good is? Yeah, my point is, we, we just don't know it all. Not even oh, close. Oh, 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 sure. So, so therefore, uh, if you're going to say God actually is good, and a quarter million people dying from an earthquake and a tsunami and and other natural disasters, right. um, and God presumably has control over that and God is good, then we have to then say God works in mysterious ways, right? Yeah, so there that, you go. That's that. But people only say that when their understanding of God fails them. When right? it's a, something bad. No, no, when they can't <laughs> understand it, they say, well, God works in mysterious right, right, ways. Right, but yeah, somehow, in these other ways, you did understand him. Right. How are you saying, well, this is the, this is the handiwork of God. Is you're doing God's work. God wants you to do this. Somehow you know God's motives every other way. Mm -hmm. when, but when a quarter million people get wiped out, God works in mysterious ways. Mm -hmm. why, do you, why, why do you even claim to have access to God's mind in some contexts and not others? Yeah, exactly. Just admit you have no clue right. and get on with life. That's how I look at it. We just don't have a, a clue when it comes down to it. Well, I'd like to think that preserving being, health and longevity, that is a nice operational definition of something that's good. Right. How can you argue? Why, how can you debate something that keeps you alive and healthy? That's got to be a, something that's good. I, mm. I can't. I'm, I'm, I refuse to allow someone to say, I'm going to give you cancer, birth defects, and shorten your life and somehow call that good. I, I, I'm not going <laughs> yeah. there. Oh, I hear you. I hear you. I, I'm not going there. In the vast darkness of the cosmos, humanity once looked up and saw mystery. 
lightning, eclipses, plagues, the birth of life itself, all seemed like the signature of gods. When we didn't know, we invented answers. This is where religion began, as our first attempt to explain what we could not understand. But there's a pattern. Every time science uncovers the mechanism behind a once mysterious phenomenon, the space where we placed God shrinks. This is what we call the God of the gaps. Wherever our knowledge has holes, some insert the divine as a placeholder. But with each discovery, those gaps close, one by one. Thunder is no longer the voice of Zeus. Disease is no longer the punishment of an angry deity. The earth is not the center of the universe and never was. Science does not kill wonder, it expands it. It replaces fear with curiosity, dogma with evidence, faith with understanding. Religion may offer comfort, but science offers answers. Answers that work, answers we can test, build upon, and use to shape the future. The more we know, the less room there is for gods. And perhaps that is the most profound revelation of all, that the universe is not shaped for us, but that we have the power to understand it anyway.